Again, welcome uh, everybody to this class. And uh, my name is Aaron. I'm the body master of Felicis. Thank you all for joining us. I'll now hand it over to Frater Adamasto. All right, welcome everyone, 93. Thank you for coming. This is the uh, introduction to Goetic Magic class that I have prepared for Thelesis Oasis. Um, so we're gonna just kind of jump right into it and I'll take you through the first intro slides. So I wanna give a little bit of background about me um, and why I feel like I have something to teach in this class. Um, because there's a lot of people out there who are into Goetic Magic. There's a lot of misinformation out there. There's a lot of people who like to give information that may or may not be uh, backed up by anything. So um, I've been practicing Goetic Magic for nearly two decades. I started when I was uh, a teenager. Um, I am the owner and founder of Goetic Impressions, um, and I am a lifelong student of the occult mysteries. Um, I've been into this since I could read, basically. Um, and what we'll be covering in this class, we're going to do a basic overview of the Ars Goetia and Goetic Magic. Um, we're going to cover some techniques for beginners, some stuff that's maybe not uh, quite on the traditional path, a little bit more um, stuff you can do outside of the evocation setting, outside of a full ritual setting. We're going to do some explanations on the different approaches to Goetic Magic and what makes people gravitate toward one over another. Um, there's some different schools of thought. Um, on how to structure your rituals, what's appropriate in a ritual and what's not. Um, we're going to cover kind of a little bit of an overview of some of that. Um, how to get started on doing a full evocation yourself and working with a goetic entity, and where you can go to learn more, uh, get some additional resources, and take it to the next step after this class. So what is goetic magic anyway? I imagine most people here are familiar, um, at least with the broad overview of it. Um, but we're going to dig in a little bit in case anyone's new to this. Um, this is their first time. So it's a class of magic dealing with chthonic entities, which are uh, lower entities, uh, typically more chaotic, um, more primal, uh, less, shall we say, refined or orderly than um, some of the angelic entities that you might deal with in other uh, classes of magic or other structures of rituals. It's most often associated with the Ars Goetia from the Lesser Key of Solomon. Um, it's not strictly related to the Lesser Key of Solomon, but when people think Goetic entities, they think um, the 72 in the Lesser Key of Solomon. There are some entities that are not in the catalog in the Lesser Key of Solomon that are considered Goetic entities, things like Clawneck from the Grimoire Varium. Um, a lot of people lump Lilith in, um, even though Lilith is not strictly a goetic entity. Um, there's a few other grimoires that you will find uh, spirits that are classed as goetic spirits, even though they are outside of the Lesser Key of Solomon. The Grand Grimoire and the Grimoire Varium are two places where you'll, you'll find several. Um, goetic grimoires are often known for long catalogs of spirits with descriptions, um, starting back with the Pseudomonarchia Daemonum and all the way through the Lesser Key of Solomon now. Um, you get just long lists of spirits and this guy does this, this guy does that. Um, traditionally, they're lighter on information that doesn't deal strictly with these catalogs of spirits, um, but it's useful for at least knowing who you're working with. So why practice Goetic Magic? Uh, it's effective. You know, that's one of the reasons it's been so um, uh, so highly practiced and um, widely practiced uh, for so long. Uh, it's relatively simple to learn uh, compared to things like Enochian or other ceremonial systems, um, which are a lot more complicated, have a lot more double blinds and misinformation about them. And it's one of the most well-known forms of ceremonial magic. Um, it's hard to find anyone who's seriously into uh, the occult scene that has not heard of goetic magic um, or is not familiar with it in some respect. So it has a very strong negative stigma associated with it. Um, I'm sure people have run into this everywhere they've been on the internet. Um, or not everywhere they've been, but everywhere they've been that relates to this, there's always uh, something you'll hear negative about this. There's someone who's had a bad experience. Um, there's someone who has a, a horror story that they've heard from someone else. Um, some people have had 
the horror stories happen to them personally. Um, a big part of this is early Christian influences. They regarded um, these entities as strictly demonic coming from hell. Um, a lot of the early grimoires that we rely on for some of our information about them, like the Pseudomonarchia Daemonum or the Heptarcha, um, have Christian uh, text in them to try and make the books less likely to get their owners killed. Um, so it was very strong condemnation of the spirits that they're dealing with, um, things like that, because if an inquisitor came into a house or a priest came into the house or someone thumbed through the book, um, they didn't want, they wanted a little bit of plausible deniability um, kind of in the book. Um, so a lot of what we're reading is passed down with these kind of, um, these spirits are evil, never call them up sort of thing um, in the book. So there's a strong focus on material results in the Goetic system. It's not so much about elevating yourself or bettering yourself where you find in other magical systems. Um, it's very focused on the material and things that are focused on the material kind of feed into your ego. Um, things that you want instead of things that you need. And a lot of times the results you get are not really the results that would help you, but they're what you asked for. Um, operator error, it's fairly easy to make some mistakes. Most of the time the mistakes you get are not going to cause your house to blow up or anything like that. Um, errors of that magnitude are very rare. It's generally fairly easy to clean up after yourself if you do make a mistake, um, but it is relatively easy to make a mistake. Um, lack of proper preparation or respect. Um, if you're dealing with a goetic entity and you're not respecting it, if you're not prepared to deal with it, um, if you're not taking it seriously, you can get yourself in some trouble. Um, and some of the spirits can just be nasty. And I have a little picture of Andras here as a uh, sort of demonstration of that. Um, there are some of the goetic spirits that are just not pleasant to work with. Um, they're generally advised to stay away from. So what are goetic spirits anyway? Uh, I felt like I had to have this in here. Um, there's a bunch of people who would tell you what they think they are. And they'll give you all sorts of information about why they think that. Um, thought forms, entities that are separate from yourself, aliens, something else, um, a mixture of all of the, the different theories or something. We don't really know. We're probably never going to know. Um, if you interact with them, you'll kind of get a sense of, of them for yourself. But the way that you interact with them and the way that another person interacts with them and how they present to another person are going to be different. Um, there are some similarities that will cross, um, be across all of the, all experiences, but um, it's very individual in how you're going to experience them in a ritual setting. Um, and a large part of that comes down to how you're structuring your rituals as well. So using goetic magic without an evocation, uh, you're just getting started. You don't want to go through the whole ritual ceremony. Um, you're a little bit worried maybe about messing something up. You just want to get your feet wet without doing the whole uh, shebang. So there's a bunch of things you can do to kind of get started without um, going overboard right away. Uh, some really simple things is offerings. You could set up uh, a little altar or a little place on your altar um, with the entity sigil or name, um, and then just leave offerings for it. Uh, maybe a little petition as well, saying, you know, uh, so and so, could you help bring a little bit money uh, into my life, or um, could you help keep away something that's threatening me or putting me in danger? Uh, the the coworker at work who keeps, you know, saying something uh, to me or about me. Can you, you know, silence that guy? Um, that's something that you can do without doing a full evocation. Um, how effective it is is going to depend on a lot of factors, but it's something that you can kind of do to get started in a way. Um, candle magic is something similar. You can take a candle, carve the sigil um, or the demon's name into the candle, um, place it on top of a petition, you know, a written request, and just burn the candle. Um, you can burn it all in one sitting. You can burn it over time. Um, but it's kind of a way to tap into that energy without doing a full 
uh, evocation. Um, both these kind of tie into petitions. You're going to want to petition with basically anything you do, um, either written or spoken, saying what it is you're hoping to get out of this interaction. Um, spirit houses and spirit pots. This isn't really something that you can do before you do an evocation, but it's something you could do after an evocation to make calling up a particular spirit easier or to not have to go through the full ritual every time you want to interact with the spirit. Um, this is a spirit pot for Dantalion that I made. Um, and what it allows you to do is you basically do the evocation and you make an agreement with the spirit um, saying that once a week you'll burn incense to it or something like that, um, if it will agree to work with you more closely. Um, you create a home for the spirit um, and you set it up with things that will be synonymous with that spirit. So for Dantalian, I used graveyard dirt, I used calamus, I used dried rose petals, um, things like that, which are inside this uh, pot that's dedicated to Dantalian. And it gives that kind of a closer connection. If I uh, want to contact Dantalian right away, you know, you take off the top, um, you can throw a little petition into the bottle, you can say out loud what you're hoping to get out of the interaction. And it allows you a little bit of a closer connection um, with the spirit. And then there's just sigil magic, just using the actual uh, sigils or seals um, of the entities can be fairly powerful by itself. Um, leaving them somewhere, carving them somewhere. Uh, a popular method with, uh, with this is taking Bune's sigil and putting it on a dollar bill, um, along with a little written out petition in the corner of the dollar bill. And then you spend it somewhere. Um, usually something like bring this dollar back to me or go out and bring more money back to me. Um, and that's a little something you can do too. Um, there's a bunch of different ways to use all of these. Uh, those are just a couple examples, but that kind of start get you thinking about other things you can do outside of the ritual evocation space. So the bornless one, headless one ritual. Um, I wanna to touch on this just a little bit because it is fairly popular within this um, school of magic, even though it's not native to it. Um, the Bornless One ritual is originally from the Greek magical papyri, uh, PGM-5. It's currently in the Museum of London. Um, and it was added to the Lesser Key of Solomon in 1903 by Aleister Crowley. It was one of his sole contributions to that publication, um, despite his foreword that says otherwise. Um, it was primarily written by S. L. McGregor Mathers, but he associated this particular ritual with uh, the Goetic ritual very strongly. It's something that's kind of grown into it since then, um, because this book was one of the books that really popularized this style of magic coming into the uh, modern era. Um, so it, it is an effective ritual uh, for preliminary setup for Goetic magic. Um, it kind of presents the operator as someone with spiritual authority. You are basically tapping into the god Asaru and Nefer um, and taking on that god form with which to work your Goetic evocation magic, which gives, which gives you kind of that authority over the spirits which you need in order to um, make them appear um, or ask them to appear. Um, it puts you in a position where you have a little bit more authority than you do as just a regular person. Um, it's also used by modern practitioners in the Abramelin uh, ritual uh, for knowledge and conversation of the Holy Guardian Angel. Um, people typically use the version found in Liber Samic for that. So the, there's three primary Goetic methods, and I kind of simplified this a little bit, but there's the traditional method, there's demonolatry, and then there's modern. And I kind of lumped everything else under modern. Um, traditional is basically following the text of the old grimoires, the Lesser Key of Solomon, following it as closely as possible, getting all of the tools, um, getting all of the ritual implements, etc. cetera. Um, demonolatry is, it's basically as old as traditional, but it's really come into its own um, in the last, I wanna say 60 or 70 years uh, that people have been practicing it more than anything else. And then modern is kind of a mishmash. Um, people taking traditional methods, taking, people taking methods from demonolatry, um, and then other methods from other places, uh, chaos magic, um, Santero, um, voodoo, et cetera, and kind of merging them into this ritual format. 
So in the traditional method, we have a rigid ritual structure. Um, it's very uh, scripted what you're doing and when you're doing it. Um, there's a lot of memorization involved. There's a lot of invocations, threats, um, tortures, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you're, you're meant to be doing these at the, script, at the specific times uh, following the script. Um, the invocations have a lot of Christian influences. And this is, again, because a lot of these books had Christian influences in the 1500s, 1600s, 1700s. Um, in order to protect the people who had these books, you know, who owned them. Um, th all that being said, this method is very effective. Um, this is the method that has basically made this style of magic popular and brought it into the um, sort of cultural place that it is today. Most people don't follow the traditional method when they're doing uh, goetic workings. But I would recommend anyone who's starting out with the style of magic to start with the traditional method um, because it gets results. The, the whole thing is very well set up. It's very well scripted. You know exactly what to do if things go wrong. Um, and as long as you're following the system, you will get results. So demonolatry. Um, demonolatry was really popularized by Connolly um, fairly recently but it's been around since, since the 1600s. Um, the main thing that demonolatry brings to goetic magic, in my opinion, is the demonic ends. Uh, the demonic ends are basically a shorthand uh, invocation for a particular spirit. Um, it's usually four or five words. For instance, for Asmodai, it's Ayer, Avage, Aleren, Asmodai, Aken. Um, which you repeat like a mantra several times during your invocation in order to get the spirit to appear. Um, in the demonolatry system, you can have a very shortened version of an invocation because you're using an N for that specific spirit. Um, it's basically like a telephone number. Um, it lets you call it up a lot faster than, say, writing an email, um, I suppose. Um, one of the main drawbacks to the demonolatry system, in my opinion, is that it puts the operator into a subservient position to the entity. Um, you are calling on the entity from a position of weakness. Uh, you are acknowledging that it is a larger, more powerful thing than you, and you are asking it to help you out with whatever problem um, you're having, with whatever request you have. Um, it still can be very effective in getting results. But you are, at best, you're in an equal position with the spirit. And many, many times, you're in a lesser uh, or weaker position, which opens you up to more negative consequences. Um, the spirit can demand more things from you in return for doing what you're asking it to. Um, you can end up in some weird positions where you're offering more than you uh, had wanted to offer in return for. Um, whatever it is that uh, you're getting. Um, it lacks the threats, the bindings, and the commands in the traditional practice, uh, again, because you're approaching the spirit from this supplicant position um, where you're asking it um, for its help instead of commanding or binding or threatening it for help. Um, you often develop a strong personal bond, usually with a particular spirit, but sometimes with several. Um, and Typically, this is the, the style or the tradition where you're going to find tattoos, blood offerings, and things like that um, when working with these spirits. Um, if you're not comfortable giving a blood offering or getting a tattoo of a spirit or something else, um, you're probably going to want to stay away from this a little bit. But I'm a really big fan of the ends. And I feel like you can take the ends from the system and use them um, with a more rigid ritual structure uh, to pretty good results. I've, I've been pretty successful with that. Um, so modern, and I kind of lumped everything else under the modern system. Um, the modern system is experimental and it's different from one practitioner to another. Um, you're probably not gonna find two modern practitioners who structure their ritual in the same way. Um, there's a lot of trial and error. Um, and as a result, I do not recommend doing things in this way for beginners. Um, you want a firm set 
you, you want a firm background in getting results before you start experimenting with adding and taking away things from the ritual and kind of making it your own. Um, coming at it, experimenting at first, it's going to be very, very difficult to get results. Um, you, you don't know what's essential. You don't know. Um, you don't know what you don't know, honestly. And so I would recommend anyone starting with this to start with traditional, um, get your feet wet a little bit with demon ultry, um, at least do it one time um, to, to get a feel of approaching a spirit from that position. And then you can start to experiment a little bit more um, with kind of mixing the two together, adding in other things from your other spiritual practices and seeing where that takes you. So to banish or not to banish, this is a big debate sort of in Goetic Magic and in uh, any kind of magic dealing with spirits in general. Um, me personally, I say always banish before you start the ritual, no matter what you're doing. Um, the main argument against banishing is it can be seen as rude to the spirit that you're interacting with to banish it right after the ritual. Um, the spirit is not really present before you start the ritual, banishing will clear the area of any kind of lingering energies, any kind of um, negativity or anything that might interfere with or give you kind of mixed results in your ritual. Um, so you want to get rid of any kind of lingering energies, anything on yourself, anything in the room, anything that might interfere with or distract, um, cause confusion, or interfere with uh, manifesting what you're going for. If you're using demon altry, you never want to banish post evocation. Um, doing it is seen extremely rude in that sort of technique. Um, again, you're approaching the spirit from kind of a supplicant position. So approaching it and asking it for help and then turning around and saying that you have the authority to kick it out kind of flips the whole system on its head. Um, you're sending mixed messages basically to the universe with that and it just doesn't work very well. Um, you're always going to banish, on the other hand, after an evocation when you're using traditional techniques. It's part of the script. Um, if you're sticking to the traditional script, you're going to banish post ritual. Um, so if you're using a, mi a mix up, a modern technique, then the banishing is optional depending on your level of familiar familiarity with the spirit, the overall tone or tenor of the ritual and what you're looking to accomplish exactly. Um, sometimes in the system, banishing is correct. Sometimes it is not correct. Um, it depends on how you're approaching the spirit, how you're uh, approaching the ritual, and the overall feel you're going for with your ritual. If you're using um, threats and bindings and commands, then you're going to want to banish afterward. If you're approaching the spirit more as an equal, asking for a favor, asking for an exchange, um, where you're giving an offering or something like that in exchange for um, results, then maybe banishing post ritual is not what you're going to look, uh, what you're going to be going for there. So proper ritual setup. Um, I have a circle here with question with a question mark because there's a lot of people who don't like to use a circle, um, and there's some reasons for that. Me personally, I would say to always use a circle. Uh, to operate in because, again, it keeps the area where you're operating clear of excess energies and distractions. But the triangle of manifestation where you trap the spirit in order to interact with it, that is more of an optional kind of thing, depending on what you're going for. Um, in, in the ritual. Um, so there's a couple different things that you can use for the spirit to appear. You have your black mirror, uh, scrying crystal. Typically you're gonna be using one or the other and not both. Um, candles, which are, you know, kind of a almost required for any kind of uh, ritual magic setup. Incense, um, you basically always want incense. Something to offer the spirit. Um, it can take a bunch of different forms. It could be just the incense. You could be offering wine. You could be doing something like chocolate or uh, a meal or any number of things. Um, some people do like to use things like blood. I personally don't like to use anything that's attached to my own body. I think that 
allows the spirit to have too great an influence over you, um, both during the ritual and afterward. And even if the spirit has the best of intentions and you are very close with it, um, inviting something else to have that level of influence over you um, can lead to some bad results. Um, ritual tools, wand, sword, etc., whatever you need for your particular uh, setup, um, you can get away without any of these. Um, and some some setups are going to require all of them. Um, a wand, dagger, sword, um, the whole shebang. And you're going to want some sort of divination or communication tools, uh, pendulum, tarot, um, something of that nature, so that you can get a clear communication from the spirit. So ritual preparation. Before you start anything, um, you want to have a goal in mind, a desired outcome. Um, it needs to feel important to you. It doesn't necessarily need to be objectively um, something that matters to the wider world or something that would matter to anyone else. But if you approach a spirit with something that you feel personally is trivial or doesn't really matter, that's going to have an impact on your ritual and on your evocation. Um, it's largely seen as disrespectful to call someone up for something that doesn't really matter. Um, and if you're just playing at it, the spirit is going to know that, it's going to sense that uh, you're gonna get some bad results. Um, so choose something that feels important or something that's important to you personally. Um, and then find the right spirit for what you're looking to do. If you're looking to um, get money or you know, additional romance in your life or something like that, then choosing a spirit who causes wounds or festering uh, sores in people is probably not going to be the best choice. Um, you want something that's compatible with the outcome you're looking for. You want a spirit that's compatible with the outcome you're looking for. So that kind of ties into researching the spirit, but there's a lot more involved in researching um, the spirit that you want to uh, look into, like times that it's time times of day that it's uh, most prominent, um, which planet rules over it, which you can find by the rank or office of the spirit. For instance, dukes are associated with Venus. Um, there's particular times of the year when most of the spirits are more active. Um, there's things that they prefer for offerings, particular colors that they like, particular smells or incenses that they like, um, styles of wine that they like. Um, for instance, Dantalian likes dark chocolate. Like you wouldn't necessarily know that. Um, I'm not even sure you can find that on the internet necessarily. Some of those things you need to actually interact with the spirit to learn. But um, the more, the better prepared you are going into the operation, the better. Um, choosing a date and time of the operation, um, ideally that should tie into a planetary hour that is associated with the result you're looking for or a planetary hour that ties into the spirit you're looking for. Um, you're going to want to put out a preliminary call to the spirit, um, which I'm a big fan of this particular uh, method, um, and I've been using it a lot myself. A few days prior to whatever date and time that you've chosen for your operation, um, draw out the sigil of the spirit by hand and kind of put out a mental or a, a verbal call. Um, you know, repeat the spirit's name a few times and say what your intention is that you're going to be calling it Friday evening at seven o'clock um, and let it know to expect, you know, expect to be called by you. Um, it's a little bit more polite than just showing up uh, uninvited or unannounced and just calling uh, the spirit up. Um, and it kind of sets the mood for yourself for the next few days to kind of be focusing on uh, that call to the spirit. Um, other preliminary things uh, that you might want to set up, um, you might want to get your ritual space set up, get your offerings prepared, know, know what you're doing going in, uh, have an idea of what you want um, to expect out of it. Um, get your robes dry cleaned, you know, anything like that that you're going to need to do beforehand. Uh, avoiding negative effects. So mistakes are going to happen. Um, every evocation is a little bit different. There's hiccups that occur um, and you basically just want to avoid the 
the worst that can happen when you mess up because you will mess up. Um, so know your banishings, know how to clear your area of stray energy, stray spirits, etc. cetera. Um, LBRP is good for this, but you probably want uh, a few other things that are a little bit more advanced in your toolkit, just in case you run into some of the trouble. Um, having things that you can use physically to clean your house as well um, is great. Things like a, a floor wash that's um, been made with water that's been blessed, things like that, that you can use to to clear, to physically clean your space afterward if you need to. Um, always just be respectful of the spirit, no matter what tradition you're approaching it in, even if you're commanding and binding a spirit and threatening it um, or whatever. Keep in mind that this is a being that's powerful. You're not going to it because it's it has no power. Like if you're calling up a spirit, you're calling it up because you want something which you think it can uh, provide. And even when you're threatening the spirit or um, binding it or commanding it, um, you do have to kind of keep respect in your tone and how you're dealing with it. Uh, it can be a little bit tricky uh, to do, but as long as you're respectful of the spirit, um, you're not going to offend it too badly. Um, be ready to make amends at a later date if you do cause offense um, to the spirit. Um, have some kind of something in mind that you can do, um, a larger offering than you had initially planned, um, doing something that you know would appreciate, um, you know, being being able to apologize somehow and say, look, sorry, I messed up and I did the thing this way and instead of this other way. Um, in general, have good magical hygiene. This means um, doing your daily banishings, um, doing your meditations, doing doing your daily practices that uh, keep you free from stray negative energy um, that can kind of build up and accumulate and allow something like a mistake in a ritual to set off all of that lingering energy all at once. So actually performing an evocation. So you're gonna need some, some things for the actual day of. Um, you're gonna need your ritual space set up. Um, typically that's going to include a circle, your candles, um, some place for the, for the spirit to manifest, uh, scrying crystal, black mirror, um, triangle, something of that nature. Um, you're gonna need to know what you need to do your day of. Um, typically for me, this is going to involve um, taking a ritual bath or shower. Um, and during that, I do my initial banishing um, and then performing the uh, Bornless One ritual. Um, and I usually follow that with a mantra of Ao, Abra'o, Saba'o, um, Ia'o 100 times um, to kind of put me in the right uh, mindset to gather, kind of gather my own energies and the other energies of the Bornless One ritual um, prior to the the evocation. Um, there's also something that I I like to do. It's not really required, but I like to either fast for 24 hours or avoid meat um, for 24 hours prior to an evocation. Um, I feel like I get better results personally that way. Um, your results may vary something to try out maybe at some point. Um, and then once I've kind of gotten all that set up together, I move from my preparation space into my ritual space. Um, my ritual space is in the basement. Um, so I, I like to turn off all the lights and then kind of go downstairs into the basement with just a candle. And it kind of sets the mood for me um, that I'm entering kind of this underworld setting um, where, you know, I can interact with these beings. Um, and then I light the candles in my ritual space and the whole thing kind of slowly gets illuminated, um, which, you know, is kind of a really powerful magical moment for me even before any of the magic really starts. So the call to appear is, um, pretty important. This is the actual, you're in your ritual space now. You've already done your banish, banishing and you're, you know, you're going to try and get the demon to actually appear. Um, so in a traditional method, you're following the script. You know, I command a constrain you spirit, whatever, to appear before me now in the name of the most high, I don't know, blah, blah, blah. Um,
Um, if you're using an N, you can you know skip a lot of that, and um, you're usually going to invoke it by the power of the four directions. Um, you can name uh, a spirit at each of the four directions if you want. You can just use the four directions themselves. Um, you can go by the elemental names, but you're typically going to invoke the four directions, um, some sort of higher power, and then you're going to you know start your N mantra. Um, Sometimes you just repeat it three times. Sometimes you go until you start to feel sort of a shift in the atmosphere. Um, but that's traditionally, or not traditionally, but typically the way that I use the ends. Um, you're going to want to be calling the name of the spirit, um, whether in the traditional method or using the N, the name of the spirit will come up. Um, whatever sort of authority you're calling them by, whether it's by the four directions, whether it's by, you know, Adonai, Iao, Sabao, et cetera. Um, you know, that's going to be part of your call. Um, and then the use of chants or mantras like the N. Um, sometimes you can just make the name of the demon into a chant or a mantra, just repeating it over and over. Um, you can use something like uh, the line from the Borderless One Ritual, Ao, Abrao, Basiam, Isaac, Sabao, Iao. Um, you can repeat over and over until um, the spirit appears regularly calling its name every every dozen repetitions or so. Um, and something like that is, is typically good. Um, for the actual manifestation of the spirit, um, you're going to want either you're doing your black mirror, scrying crystal, or triangle of manifestation. Um, all three of these are fine. I've used all three methods. All three will work. Um, you may not get a full visible uh, manifestation of a spirit, uh, regardless of what you're doing. Um, some of the spirits don't like to appear um, super well. Sometimes you'll get a crawling sensation across your skin. Um, the smell in the room will change. Um, you'll hear something that doesn't sound right. Um, something like that. And the way that you're going to interact with the spirit is going to be different for each spirit and for each person. Um, some people get a very strong tactile response, um, a very strong like crawling of the skin or chills, something like that, um, that, that, that they're feeling physically. Um, some people see things very easily. Some people hear things, music, tinkling, um, maybe like glass breaking. Um, things like that. So what, how, how it appears is going to be different. Um, and then how it communicates is going to be different for each person also. Um, I recommend having at least two methods of communication available um, in case one of them is less effective for the particular spirit or in the particular moment. Um, the, the two that I usually use are a pendulum and the Thoth tarot deck. Um, whatever tarot deck you have on hand is, is probably going to be fine. I really prefer the Thoth one. Um, because in addition to the the cards themselves, um, if you draw multiple cards and lay them out, um, the words across the bottom will often spell out some interesting uh, communications. Uh, I've gotten some very some very weird messages that way. Um, so I, I've been a big fan of that, and it also lends itself very well to being recorded after the ritual, um, saying what cards were drawn in response to what questions. Um, Sometimes you will be able to hear the spirit clearly, either mentally or audibly. Um, in my experience, it's very rare to hear a spirit uh, communicate audibly, but occasionally it does happen. And some people have more success with that than others. Um, but if you are doing uh, an evocation, a pendulum or tarot cards um, will almost always work. Um, and they can give some very some very good communication that you might not otherwise get. I am always very careful about mental communication. If you're hearing the spirit's voice mentally, it's very, very easy to deceive yourself about what you're hearing, to hear what you want to hear instead of what's actually being said. Um, and yeah, I, I would just be very careful about mental communication. If, if your meditation game is really strong um, and you know what you're doing, and you're experienced, you can probably do it, but it's it's a very easy trap to fall into listening to the voice inside your head that's you instead of the spirit. So the petition, uh, this is the part of the ritual where 
you're going to be asking for what you want. Um, so again, have a clear desire or outcome. Uh, be very careful with your actual wording. Um, you don't want to misstate what you want or ask for what you want in an ambiguous or uh, confusing way. Um, you want to know exactly what you're asking for and you want to make it clear what you're asking for. Um, it never hurts to flatter the spirit. They all like flattery in my experience. Um, I have not yet encountered one in any ritual setting where flattery did not did not help you out. Um, and then listen and divine for responses. Um, if if the spirit is telling you that it can't do something or you need to do something first in order for your results to manifest, that's important. Um, if for instance, you say, I want a thousand dollars in my bank account by Monday, um, but for whatever reason, you don't have an, a way that the spirit can manifest a thousand dollars in your life. Um, if there's not an avenue for that to manifest, then you might get a response saying that I can't do that, or you need to go out and do X, Y, and Z in order for this money to manifest. Um, so if you need to change what you're asking for, or if some sort of behavior is necessary from you in order to uh, manifest what you're looking for, that's fairly important. Um, and a place where a lot of people miss getting the results that they're looking for. Um, the offering. So visualization versus physical. Um, you can make a physical offering on the spot to the spirit. Thank you for coming um, here. Enjoy this wine. Um, you know, thank you for coming here. Enjoy this incense. Uh, you can make a promise of a future offering as well, in which case you're normally going to be visualizing um, what it is you're going to offer in the future. Uh, you're going to say, you know, once you manifest this for me, I will get you, you know, uh, a glass of wine or, or a home-cooked meal or whatever the case. Um, it's important that, that if you do that, you're going to follow through on it as well at a later date. Um, and promise of future offerings or uh, continuing offerings. You know, things like every, every week I will do this for you as long as you keep manifesting this in my life. Um, and presenting an offering, you're going to want to, again, be respectful. Um, say, I, I hope you accept this offering, uh, something of that nature. Um, sometimes the spirit will make it clear that they don't, they're not interested in what you're offering. Um, again, you know, look at, look at what your divination is telling you, uh, the activity on your pendulum, the cards that are coming up in the, the tarot. Um, if you're offering something traditionally associated with the spirit or that the spirit normally enjoys, um, you're probably gonna be fine, but every so often, an offering is not adequate for what you're asking for um, or just not needed or wanted at that time. Um, if you need to make a switch to something else, you know, you brought the wrong kind of incense or something like that, uh, pay attention to that as well. Um, the dismissal, to banish or not to banish. Um, typically just a license to depart is fine. Uh, I did notice some people talking about the license to depart in the chat. Um, you know, thank you for coming. You can go back to wherever you came from um, and be ready to come again when I have need of you. Uh, something of that nature, um, usually fine. Um, if you had a particularly contentious experience or something negative happened or you made a mistake, there's some weird energy floating around, you're probably going to want to banish after the, the license to depart. Um, one time that I was working with Andras, um, I had a, a particularly negative experience where partway through the ritual, uh, like I mentioned before, I do most of my work in a basement. And um, there was about a dozen centipedes that just flew out at me from, I'm not sure where they came from. Um, but they went all around the circle. They did not cross the circle, but they were present through the entire ritual. Um, and I felt like at the end of that, uh, a banishing was necessary and uh, several other 
cleanup activities were warranted afterward as well. Um, so depending on what happens in the ritual and the overall tenor of the interaction, uh, you may want to banish even if you typically don't. Um, you probably don't want to banish immediately or even dismiss the spirit immediately. If you have incense burning, um, often you want to wait until the incense is burned out or nearly burned out um, before you dismiss the spirit. Let it enjoy the offerings. Let it enjoy the incense before you kind of kick it out of the room. Um, you also don't want to dismiss the spirit if you're asking for something, if you're asking it to go out and do something right away. Um, you don't want to send it back to whatever kind of nebulous void it came from if you're asking it to go immediately and do something. Um, in that case, you know, allow it to go and do what it's doing. Um, you know, go and do my will or something like that, which is a form of dismissal as well, but you're not sending it, uh, you want to be careful with the go back to whence you came kind of uh, language there um, because you don't want to send it to go do what you ask it to do and then kick it back to where it lives. Um, again, be respectful um, of the spirit. You don't want to be antagonistic or, um, yeah, just always be respectful of the spirits. And then again, wording is important, um, exactly what you say and how you say it. Um, if you are just letting the spirit loose but not sending it anywhere, then it can just linger in the room. Um, and that can cause some problems for you later on as well. So recording the ritual. Um, after the ritual, you want to write down everything that happened. Um, any kind of direct communications from the spirit or anything you heard or very strongly felt um, or felt very strongly the spirit was saying, you should record. You should record the methods that you used. Anything that you did that you felt like you messed up, um, a place you stumbled over a word maybe, um, a place where you weren't 100% sure you said the right thing, um, whether you banished or not. Um, anything odd or unexpected that happened, you know, uh, there was a car accident outside or someone, you know, uh, honked a horn. Um, anything that uh, may be out of the ordinary, um, any odd feelings or sensations, anything you saw, heard, or smelled that's unusual or out of the ordinary. Um, it's, never, it's never wrong to have too much information here. You don't know later on what might um, be important. Um, or what you might want to refer to later. Um, sometimes a, a weird smell or a, sort of a, an innocuous smell that comes up during a ritual um, can come up later that uh, week um, or a couple days after because the spirit's trying to draw attention to something um, that you've you know, that, that's relevant to the the manifestation you're looking for. Um, Again, you know, the feelings and the sensation, same sort of thing. Um, you could be reading something and then all of a sudden you feel the same sort of tingling on your arms you felt during the ritual because that's something that's important. Um, it's also common to have dreams after an evocation um, and you probably want to be recording those as well. Um, the next day or two worth of dreams for, you know, those who don't keep a regular dream journal anyway um, because dreams can often be um, a form of post Evocation uh, communication. Um, follow up. You want to make sure you do anything you told the spirit you were going to do. Um, if you said, you know, if you get me that new car that I want, then I'm going to get you whatever, then, you know, make sure you deliver on what you said you were going to do. Um, if you don't, the things that you got are probably going to be short lived um, or bring uh, some misfortune with them. Um, Disposing of old offerings, uh, especially food offerings, um, you want to leave them out long enough that the spirit can enjoy them. Uh, you don't want to discard them while the spirit is still uh, kind of um, enjoying their essence, shall we say. Um, but you also don't want moldy food uh, stinking up your altar or in your space um, or whatever. Um, usually waiting at you know 12 hours from sundown to sundown till sunset or sun up till sundown uh, is plenty of time. Um, and then when you dispose of it, be respectful. Usually take it outside somewhere, leave it by a tree. Um, if it's wine, you know you can uh, pour it out into the ground, something like that. 
um, and just thank the thank the spirit as you do. Um, and then cleaning up your ritual space. Um, again, you don't want to leave things out for too long. Um, to just leaving a ritual space set up can often attract some weird energy. Uh, it's fine if you banish regularly, but uh, if you don't, you don't necessarily want energy accumulating in a place where other people are going to be stumbling across it. Um, and then ongoing workings, you know, make sure you follow up with whatever you said you were going to do. If you're offering something every week, um, if you're interacting with a spirit on a regular basis, if you set up a spirit house or a spirit pot, uh, make sure you fulfill those commitments that you made. Learning from errors. So this kind of goes back to recording as much information as possible. You're going to make mistakes. Um, things are going to go wrong. Things are just not going to happen when you expected things to happen. You're not going to get results that you wanted or no results at all. So go back, review your notes, um, see where you departed from the system that you were trying to use. Um, if you're using the traditional, uh, like a traditional Lesser Key of Solomon text, this is fairly easy to do because it's very scripted. Um, if you're using kind of a mishmash of your own system, then maybe don't mishmash so much. Um, you know, whatever elements you took out from a traditional system or, or a more established system, maybe add those elements back in uh, from that traditional or established system um, and go a little bit more slowly with your experimentation. Uh, correct your mistakes, try again, try new techniques, um, you know, different different banishing techniques, different ways of um, perhaps different uh, things to try beforehand. Like maybe instead of the bornless one ritual beforehand, you try a, uh, a pillar and spheres technique to see how, what kind of energy or spiritual authority that gives you for working with uh, the spirits. You know, there's a bunch of things you can try um, and experiment with to see what results that they give you. Um, different things are going to work better or worse for different people. There's no 100% tried and true technique that's this is the thing, this is the way to do it for everyone. Everyone will get the best results with this one technique. Um, I, I very adamantly believe that experimenting with your own individual pro, uh, practice and process will get you personally the best results. Um, but that being said, you want to try with you want to start with an established method for getting results. Um, and then sort of tweak things from there as you learn and as you gain experience. Um, adding and removing specific items or ritual components, you know, like maybe you try a dagger instead of a sword or a sword instead of a dagger or a dagger instead of a wand um, or just using your finger instead of a wand. Um, or like I said, you know, using pillar and spheres technique instead of uh, the bornless one ritual um, for your pre-ritual uh, sort of, um, empowerment. So ritual tools. Uh, I have to shout out Goetta Compressions because I own Goetta Compressions. Um, and we do have some cool stuff for Goetia as well as Nokian. You can see some of both here. Um, there's a bunch of other places out there that sell stuff. Um, and there's nothing wrong with making your own as well for the sigils, the seals your own ritual tools and implements, they're going to probably be stronger and work better for you if you make them yourself and put your own energy and um, time and effort into crafting your own ritual tools. That being said, it's not always feasible for everyone. Um, if you're getting them from someone else, make sure they kind of know what they're doing uh, and make sure the tools fit the ritual that you're trying to do. If you're going for a very heavily traditional approach, you don't necessarily want you know, slap together tools that don't aren't made of the proper wood or the um, the correct uh, the correct sort of paper or the correct sort of uh, lion skin belt, shall we say, um, which is the example everyone likes to use. Um, so make sure the tools you're getting fit the ritual you're using, um, because if they don't, then you might kind of end up in this weird space where you're not getting results and you don't understand why. Uh, and additional resources. So if you're looking to learn more after this class, like you want to go out and you want to learn everything about this, um, start with the classic grimoires, the Lesser Key of Solomon, um, 
the Ceremony Book of Black Magic by Arthur Edward White, um, which was written before the Lesser Key of Solomon and has a lot of the same stuff in it. Um, Arthur Edward White was another Golden Dawn member um, who who was there with uh, S.L. McGregor Mathers, and they both kind of offered their own take on this in their respective grimoires. Um, you can go back to things like the Pseudomonarchia Daemonum. Um, it doesn't really have the ritual tools in it, but it does have the catalog of spirits, and there are some notable differences um, between the lesser, the modern Lesser Key of Solomon that people use and things like the Pseudomonarchia Daemonum. Um, that was written by Johann Weyer, if anyone wants to look that up. Um, look for reputable authors. Uh, Jason Miller's fairly reputable. He's not he hasn't published anything yet for uh, Goetic Magic. I understand he is working on an um, evocation book. I think it'll be out in another few years. Um, Stephen Skinner. Um, he is very well, very well known, very reputable, um, big proponent of traditional techniques. Um, I would very, very much recommend him. Jake Stratton Kent, Colin Campbell. Um, there are quite a few others. Um, there's a lot of uh, Rufus Opus, not Rodney Opus. Uh, Rufus Opus is, yeah, Rufus Opus is great. Um, I'm a big fan of Rufus Opus. And even with even if you're not doing Goetic Magic, um, Rufus Opus has uh, his seven spheres technique is really, really good for manifesting spirits in crystals. So I would definitely recommend um, the seven spheres uh, by Rufus Opus. Um, online groups, you know, there's a bunch of online groups. Be very careful the kind of information that you source from the internet. Um, you know, double fact check what you're getting. Uh, you don't necessarily know if the people you're interacting with know what they're talking about or not. Um, so even like the info that I've talked about today, um, don't go and do it yourself without fact checking and doing your own research. Um, make sure you understand what it is that you're putting into your magic and why. Um, because if you don't, if you don't understand, if you're just if I or someone else say by rote because it's something that we said, then you're probably gonna not have the best results. All right, so questions. Uh, I'm going to open it up now. Um, we're a little bit over time. So 